Well, welcome everyone to the live community discussion series on uh, how you're adapting to, uh, how are you adapting to the, the new normal. Uh, we have today Renee Shepard as our guest. I'm going to turn it over to Bud to do a, an introduction for her because they are compadres in this whole thing. So, uh, Bud, you want to take it? You bet. Renee, we're really glad to have you with us today. I've known Renee for a long time. I won't say how long, right? Because we look much younger than we, than we are. But she has been a leader in the Lexington community for, for many years. Uh, she is the former director of the Downtown Lexington Corporation and has been an advocate for the homeless in Lexington for many years. So she's not only a great professional who gets things done, she's someone who has compassion and care and is able to make Lexington a place that is better for all people. So we're super glad to have you with us today talking about how we can get back to work in a healthy way. Thank you, Bed, for that introduction and for the opportunity to join you all today. As we deal with our new normal, or what I hope is our temporary new normal, I think it's really important for people to start thinking about all the changes that we're going to need to have happen before business can reopen, and also as consumers, just some of the changes that we can expect to see. Um, just a brief recap on how we got, um, how this virus changed our lives so quickly. The first cases were reported in Wuhan, China in December of 2019. And then on January 1st, or January 21st, we had our first case here in the United States in Washington State. And on March 6th in Kentucky, we had our first confirmed case, and that was a woman in Harrison County. Uh, the governor began to take swift action at that time. He closed schools on March 13th for all in-person instruction in K through 12. And then the following Monday on March 16th, he ordered all bars and restaurants to close except for curbside and delivery. And this was no doubt uh, strategic knowing that the next day was St. Patrick's Day. So later that week, all forward facing businesses were ordered to cease operations. So within about three months, everyone's lives were completely upended. And yeah. Our Renee, that's where we got to this, and, and we've been talking about this uh, remote work uh, transformation model, uh, because, you know, this is the situation that kind of got us in, and we were all kind of stuck with, okay, we need to accomplish things, and everything's dysfunctional, so, so how do we do this? And we've really, you know, been able to navigate through basic work functionality and delivering essentials, but we're even to the point of adapting uh, processes and really transforming how we work um, so that... Um, our people processes and tools can can begin to get back to some some standard you know standard operations but my guess is and my intuition tells me we're, we're going to be right back there so uh, you know I think you and and all of us have been listening uh, as you said to the governor and other sources talk about healthy at work in Kentucky do you want to cover some of those things that you've put together sure so initially, Governor Bashir said that in order for the economy to open back up, we would have to meet all of these benchmarks. The 14 days of decreasing cases was the number one indicator, and then things like increased testing capacity and personal protection equipment were going to have to be met in order to open. However, we've seen this plateauing effect, even after we ramped up uh, testing considerably, we haven't seen a dramatic spike in positive cases. So they made the decision to go ahead and start easing restrictions gradually. So as long as we stay in this plateauing stage, we'll likely continue, continue to see restrictions ease. But if we do see a spike, they've warned us that they will probably reinstitute restrictions. So we need to keep in mind that there could be some setbacks along the way. But we definitely will have to meet the 10 rules to reopening, which are shown here. Um, they all have to be met prior to reopening. As the governor has stated many times, just because your business can reopen, that doesn't mean they should reopen. And if you can't do all 10 of these things, you're not allowed to reopen. So looking at them individually, um, continuing to telework when possible, and number two, phase return to work, they go hand in hand and they're both really important because when you start looking at industry specific guidelines to reopening, 
there's often reduced capacity requirements. So these two are gonna be really important. And then doing on-site temperature and wellness checks, uh, those have to be performed. And keep in mind that you have to be properly trained to do this. So many businesses likely don't have someone already on staff that knows what to do, or they may not have the proper PPE or thermometers. Right now, the proper PPE recommendation is the person doing the testing would have on gloves, a face mask, face shield, and a gown. Uh, number four is universal masks and other personal protection equipment. Supplies of these are very hard to come by, although we are gonna give you some uh, links later in the presentation that might help you, but you need to plan accordingly. And then closing common areas is gonna have to happen. And this means shutting down break rooms, lock rooms, and any other uh, potential gathering spots unless you can enforce strict social uh, distancing. Enforcing social distancing is obviously key. Uh, we are gonna provide a downloadable resource at the end of the presentation to give you guidance on specific areas and things that you can do to comply. This is really, really important. It's likely uh, gonna be the biggest challenge for most businesses because it takes a lot of time and money to implement uh, the requirements. And then limiting face-to-face -face meetings. We've all likely gotten very good at this over the last few months, so we just need to keep doing that. And then having sanitizer and hand washing stations. These are definitely gonna be part of the new normal and need to be abundant. And special accommodations for high-risk employees. This is a mandate to provide special accommodations, so you need to be thinking about how you're going to do this. And also, do you even know how many employees will need these special accommodations? Having a testing plan. If you have someone who's expected to be ill during the screening, what is the plan to quickly get them tested and also to reach out to the people that were in close contact with them? The state is saying they will provide further guidance on this and also on contract tracing soon. So look for that information. And then in addition to these 10 rules, you also have to meet any industry specific guidelines that are required for reopening. Those are available on the state's COVID-19 website. Initially, there was going to be an online application that had to be completed and approved before you could reopen. And now they've backed off that and it is not a requirement, but it is definitely recommended. And I would recommend that everyone look at this simply because the questions that they're asking are a really good indicator of the things you're going to need to do to safely and successfully reopen. Yeah, this is a lot of great, great information, Renee. Um, I'm wondering if for anyone who has questions that they'd like to, to, um, you know, ask at this time or put in the chat and we can uh, follow up on those, but uh, we'll go on. If there's anybody who wants to jump in uh, now. If not, we'll go on to the next slide, because this is really kind of the heart of what the phased reopenings looks like, right? Right. So Bert, we began phased reopening in late April, starting in the healthcare industry with chiropractors, dentists, eye care professionals, and some others. And this was a very intentional step on the part of the state uh, because they knew that the healthcare sector was already familiar with dealing with contamination and the use of PPE. They called it their proof of concept that we can reopen. Um, on Monday, we'll see more sectors open back up. The industry-specific guidelines for all the May 11th sectors is already published on the state's website, and they've indicated that Probably by June, we'll be able to see restaurants, gyms, and some other sectors come open. Those guidelines will be coming soon. Renee, I, I want to jump in here. Can everybody see my screen? I'm wondering whether the, the slides are available. Bud, were you going to say something about that? or? No worries. Yeah, so I can see your screen. It went away for a moment, but it looks okay. like it's back. And Very I just good. wanted to let folks know that we do have attendees and uh, when they first came on board, they weren't able to talk, but we've made it possible for everyone to talk. And okay. what I'll likely do is when we get to that q and I'll promote everyone to panelists so we can see each other. Wonderful. Sorry for interrupting you, Renee. I just want to make sure that this good information is getting out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just think, you know, it's really important that what we experienced before the shutdown and what we experience now is very different. You know, we went to an eye appointment, my daughter and I did, 
We both had to have on masks. We had to have our temperature checked prior to re-entering. We weren't allowed to use their restroom at all. Um, they had separate containers for pens that had been used and ones that had been sanitized. I think these are the kind of new normal that we're going to see and have to plan for. Um, think about all the preparation and planning that goes into preparing for a fire drill or a weather emergency to ensure that your staff and clients are safe. And that's the kind of level of planning and more that we're going to have to uh, think about and implement before businesses can reopen. Very good. So, you know, it sounds like we're going to be stuck with this uh, transformation model several different times, right? As we go through different phases here and we're going to have to stay attuned to that. Are there, are there any general guidelines that uh, you, you can see from your vantage point uh, of how folks can, can work through this and really help their, help their employees thrive? Well, definitely. I mean, in, if, if people are here in Fayette County, the mayor has her own, a committee with a lot of the di uh, different sectors that are looking at plans to reopen. So I think you'll see more and more of that where um, all of the chiropractors got together and created standards. Mo the beauty salons and things like that will come together. So I think um, it won't be as hard, but of course, every business is unique. So you're going to have to be thinking specifically about your space and, and how to communicate with your clients. Very good. And this, so this really, you know, affects our employees and the folks that we, our coworkers, as, as we work with them on a, the physical level and on the mental level, and it's going to interrupt and allow us to establish, you know, new habits and, and even, you know, provide us opportunities to, to make sure that we're providing the best value with and focusing in on what's providing the best value as we, we go forward. Mm -hmm. Th this is, this is really good. So what do you think reopening means to our businesses? Uh, I think reopening means that you're going to have to spend some money to get ready and you need to be prepared for that. You also need to be realistic that these aren't quick fixes. So if you're uh, a salon, for example, just because you can reopen on May the 25th, if you haven't already started implementing physical uh, partitions between stations and things like that, it will be very difficult. You certainly can't wait till the night before and then think you're going to turn your shingle over to open and reopen. Um, you also want to think about, again, how you're going to communicate the new processes to your clients when they show up, because the last thing you want them to do is to get mad or upset with you over some new process that they weren't aware of. So if you have social media or, or customer lists where you can be communicating what the expectation is when they arrive, that's really important. I know at my uh, veterinarian, they told me what the process was going to be on the phone when I made that appointment. But you'll have uh, businesses that don't necessarily take appointments like retail when it opens up. How is that going to work? And you certainly don't want to be getting negative publicity right now. Um, you don't want to be that restaurant in Texas that made the national news the other day for their face mask rules. Yeah, absolutely. So that means that, you know, almost every area of the business that we're in, um, and we were talking about some yesterday as we were getting ready for this, that, that I hadn't thought about until I ran across it with another uh, client that we're working with, and that, that's, uh, you know, lactation rooms and, and how important those are. And at the same time, what kind of a, um, you know, a, issues can can be involved in keeping those open for a company right and all of these areas that are listed here are going to have to be considered plus many more and again those will be in the in the downloadable document that is on celerity's website but you just need to think that you know staircases you can't have people going up and down now so can you designate one staircase to be up and the other one down if you have that luxury or you know, gone are the days of the shared coffee pot. <laughs> you can't be, you can't do that. Uh, and you'll, you'll have to have uh, lots of signage. Just signage is going to be key. So these are a lot of examples that we've come across. Um, but there's a lot of online resources for signage. And one good website that I found was ergomat.com. And that's E-R-G-O-M-A-T.com. So be prepared and start working on those signs. 
yeah, might be fun to have a competition at some point and, and figure out whether or not people can come up with clever ones because, you know, that, that's it's always fun to see what people come up with. Maybe we should do a whole meme thing on this too. Uh, I bet you there's going to be some great fodder here. So um, some other considerations that you come up with. And, you know, when we were putting this together, we talked about this Maslow hierarchy of needs. We put that out in the first uh, few webinars that we've done uh, and conversations that we've had because, you know, what I've found is at any given moment, we can be, you know, you're 15 minutes away from being down to meeting psychological and safety needs. I know for my family, personally, we're kind of at that transition stage. My wife teaches at a university and she's been teaching online. My girls are, um, my girls are finishing up their classwork. That means that the, the schedule that we've had, the habits that we've new habits that we've formed are now being disrupted. And at the same time, one of my daughters uh, has gotten a job. And so we're back down talking about what that means safety wise for the family. So, you know, there, there are a lot of considerations here that we need to think through. Absolutely. We're definitely in a different time and there are lots of new aspects of doing business that need to be considered. We've touched on flexibility a little bit and that's going to be so important. You know, telework is definitely a new normal and it'll remain part of many businesses long after COVID-19 isn't a threat. Uh, telework could also likely be the solution for people that have to self-quarantine or have childcare needs um, during, or the people that need the special accommodations. But physical distancing is also likely here to stay, at least for a little while. You know, if you think about just the simple act of how you greet someone or how you might congratulate someone, we're going to have to come up with new ways. Um, that might be another contest of what's the best way to shake a hand. <laughs> so um, I think yeah. return to work surveys and new policies are also things that are going to be needed. And you'll have to have a, a solid plan of how you're going to maintain all these new processes that are going to be necessary. I had a privilege of, of reviewing this stuff before and what you put together here, can you talk more about this re uh, return to work surveys? Cause these were things that I had not, you know, really thought about, um, sure. you know, from, yeah. my, from where I do, what I do. Well, I think return to work surveys are, they're highly recommended for a few reasons. One um, it's a way to find out if you have unhealthy workers or any un potentially unhealthy workers. So you can go ahead and make an appropriate decision about their specific return to work plan before they show up on your doorstep with a, a fever or a, a, some other symptom. And also, this is a way to understand if you have people that are going to need a special accommodation or have child care issues that might impact their availability. Because you know, if you are a small business and half your staff have special accommodation needs, then what's that really mean to reopening? Mm -hmm. So these are just a few uh, questions that you might consider. Um, have you had a fever of 104 or higher, or any flu-like symptoms? Have you traveled outside the country or the state in the last 14 days? And th this is the opportunity to say, do you need, um, is there anything else that would prevent you from coming to work? And I think many companies are going to require the completion of these types of surveys prior, prior to allowing people to return. You know, the questions can include whatever information would be useful for your particular business. And then also, uh, new policies or updated policies are something that people are going to have to start thinking about. Um, there's likely, I mean, sick leave is um, so important to keep people from coming to work when they're sick. So you need to take a look at that policy and see if there's a way to accommodate people. And then when people do have to self quarantine, are you going to uh, cover that leave or let them telework or what's your policy going to be? And then, you know, documenting processes about how you enter and exit and social distancing. Those are all going to need written policies. Mm -hmm. um, and what if somebody doesn't comply with, the, with the, the recommendations, are you going to punish them or what, you know, what is that going to look like? So uh, it's really important to make sure that you're prepared for all these different kinds of things that are going to be needed. Yeah. And, and, you know, just because I, I am who I am, one of those things would be, well, you're going to have to work from home if you can't comply. Well, maybe I don't want to comply. Maybe I want to work from home. <laughs> right, exactly. But I think, um, you know, some companies where that isn't really an option, say in manufacturing or something else that is really hard yeah. to do 
from or almost impossible to do from home. I mean, it might be that you would have to, you know, punish them. Yeah. Just like, you know, other actions that are punishable of determination. Yeah. That this is this is a lot of hard work and and you know just keeping everybody on the same page with the new policies and making sure that you've got training for all of the managers and supervisors out there. It's one thing to have to write the policies and get them approved. It's another thing to have to train your, your um, supervisors and your managers so that they can help you enforce them. And then, you know, give, communicate that out to the, the, you know, everybody else in the company. When I, this came up in a, a company that I'm familiar with, they did a mock, uh, return to work drill and it uh, didn't go as well as they had planned on paper <laughs> when they had to <laughs> physically implement there was lots of mm -hmm. running into you know little glitches so even doing something like that is not a bad idea to see yep. how it really plays out in the real world absolutely so a couple of the other things that you've talked about and I've been really impressed with is how, you know, you're, you look at the long term or the, the, you know, the near term on this maybe would be a better, a better way to talk about it. How do you maintain this and have it not be a burden for your company and really help you transform into a better organization overall? Right. So that's the, the final thing I'm going to talk about is with all these new processes and policies, you'll need to almost have a safety officer or someone who knows that they are the responsible party for overseeing and ensuring that employees do comply with safety measures, that sanitizing and cleaning is done appropriately, um, and that any other processes are, are being done as you requested. Um, you also will have to ensure that you have proper PPE and hand sanitizer. Um, so we've got a couple of, of links here. The Kentucky Chamber, I believe they they did a partnership with the state to get around 200,000 masks. At least that was the initial order. And so people can order face masks from them at that website. And they do cost a dollar uh, per mask, but at least that's a source to get mm -hmm. some of your PPE. And then hand sanitizer is also available from the Kentucky Distillers Association. Uh, and that website is also there. Prices can vary on that kind of stuff. Um, and then testing and tracing is absolutely critical. <laughs> as more sectors go back to work, as I mentioned, the state is going to provide some guidance on both of these soon, but you'll need to have a plan so that you can act quickly when you have a, a sick or potentially sick person. And finally, it's always a really good idea to get feedback when you we've got all these changes and disruptions like we're experiencing. So you want to ask your employees, you know, how are we doing? Basically, you know, uh, there's just some examples and, and trying to see if there was positives or negatives of the process and what we could do differently. And I'd also recommend that not only do you survey your employees, but do a similar type survey out to your clients, you know, after they've come into your business a few times to see how they felt. Um, I know it was very odd to have, someone standing there with a temperature gun three inches from my head uh, the first time that I had to go through a temperature check. So uh, just seeing what their experience is, is, is a good idea. Yeah, very good. So I think we want to open it up for questions. Uh, we've had a lot of great information. Uh, is there any, um, anyone who'd like to ask something or are there any questions in the chat that we want to cover? Cole or Bud? So I don't see any uh, questions in the chat yet, Bert, but what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be promoting folks to become panelists. So if they want to uh, join us, they can, they can do that. Or you can just unmute right now. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and unmute everyone. So if you want to talk, feel free. For the temperature check, is there a certain place online to order those or do you know the the process and i take it then that is completely mandatory that is mandatory right now it's in the 10 rolls okay you have to do that as far i mean that's the problem right now with some of this um, equipment is that it is really hard to come by 
So, I mean, the, the state has indicated that they're trying to open up more supply chains, but until that happens, uh, like, like I said, the governor says it all the time, if you don't, he gets that question, if we don't have the proper PPE because it's not available, can we open? And the answer is no. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else have anything? Well, while we're waiting for other folks, oh, feel free, go ahead. Can you hear me, bud? And yes. Okay, this is Nancy Ward. Um, I have a comment and then a question for Renee. First of all, we're assuming that the future site, everybody's gonna be jolly um, good to, to adhere to all these compliance uh, new procedures, but I think we have to acknowledge that there's gonna be some resistance to it. You know, we see, um, a lot of um, anxiety and acting out with people not wanting to adhere to face masks and whatever. But I think this is probably the, the biggest organizational change <laughs> um, uh, that a, a business has ever gone through. So I think we need to uh, acknowledge how we, we have to position it to minimize that resistance. My um, other question, Renee, is how is the state gonna monitor compliance or if they are and what is any punitive actions or um, consequences would be in if a business does not do that? Well, on your, com on your comment, I would like to add that that is something that a business absolutely needs to uh, think about is what is the reaction going to be if, you know, what if I had gone to the chiropractor and my temperature had been 100.4 and they turn me away and I get mad? So I think businesses need to be prepared and and almost uh, you know role play what the reaction is going to be and have a policy or a statement or something to kind of allay that. And what if um, what if somebody refuses to wear a face mask? Are you actually going to deny them service? So I think you absolutely have to think about that and be prepared. Uh, as far as monitoring and compliance. They have not actually said that yet. I would say that that is forthcoming in the next few weeks as we see businesses open. They obviously still have the, they have the hotline for people who aren't complying with social distance now. So I would assume they'll keep that up and running. But as far as any kind of punitive action, they haven't, to my knowledge, said anything yet. Thank you. Other than I guess they could, you know, they have said they would, could force you to close. And that was kind of the threat uh, to one of the sectors that really fought back on closing. And so that's when they said, well, come to us with a plan. And if you have a good plan, we'll let you reopen. And so they did. But I would assume if you had some bad players, there would be peer pressure amongst your um, other like businesses to comply or everybody would have to close. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bud, did you have something that you were going to talk about? So I know that I was just waiting to see if anyone else was, was wanting to ask any questions, but I know that uh, one of the things, Renee, that you have uh, been able to do is uh, offer your, your help to assist with businesses to do a quick audit to see how are they doing, what's their plan, policies, procedures, and uh, do they have what they need to be able to get back to work in a healthy way? Could you talk a little bit more about that? Um, it, would, it would be just a fresh set of eyes coming in to identify problem areas and make suggestions on how you can meet the social distancing requirements requirements uh, and it would just be something where we come into the business and offer suggestions on how to how to make your workplace safe for both your employees and for clients yeah that's good and i think this is something that we're all figuring out as we go i know that uh, there's government requirements but there are probably a lot more questions than there are 
answers right now. So having conversations like this, I think is really important, continuing to reach out to other folks. Um, what in your, in your mind are some of the best sources of information and uh, communication that we can have around this? But I think the state's COVID-19 website is extremely comprehensive. And then also the CDC has a good, um, a good website on recommendations. But I guess for us, that COVID-19 website is, is really important. It, and it outlines very specific guidelines by industry. But of course, there are going to be businesses that don't fall into that, that are going to have to come up with their own um, their own solutions. I think the other thing that's really important is not only just complying with what the regulations are, it's what is the expectation of the, the client. You know, my chiropractor thanked me profusely for even being brave enough to come. So I think people are gonna be looking at, uh, much like you have restaurant ratings from the health department, I think people are gonna be looking at what are your cleaning policies and, and looking around to make sure that people are social distancing. So there's that expectation just from the, the general population. So it, you need to put your best foot forward and, and comply, I think, because there's lots of research out there that says that even when um, restrictions are, list, are lifted, people are still not gonna wanna go certain places and be in crowds and things like that. Absolutely. It's a new way of operating across the board. And as we've been talking about in our past uh, webinars, we know that there's a lot of issues that we have to deal with, but there are also a lot of opportunities. What opportunities do you see coming out of this? What are some of the opportunities that you would see coming out of this for businesses and, and community organizations? Don't mean to put you on the spot there. <laughs> well, I think just, you know, I, honestly, I think there's an opportunity just to be safer. I mean, not just from COVID-19, but from the flu and just other things that we hadn't really thought about because they weren't so uh, deadly, I guess. I mean, mm -hmm. even though the flu does kill more people, then it doesn't spread the same way. So I think there's an opportunity for business uh, to step up and and just do better, if you will, than we have in the past. Uh, but there are also, you know, going to be opportunities for businesses to come in and uh, help construct. Like I, I keep going back to my to the salon example, but you know, that's a business opportunity for somebody that can actually build that type of uh, separation or the social distancing requirements. So I think there's a lot of opportunity there too. And then even just educating people on how to telework like you all have been doing. I think that's really important because a lot of people don't understand how to use the technology. And I just ex expand that question to our, our participants and our attendees. Do you want to join, you know, provide a chat that's at the bottom of your Zoom session there? or feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask the question. But uh, we're seeing a lot of businesses uh, be very innovative in the work that they do. And I saw a TED talk uh, earlier this week. I can't remember the name of the lady, but she's a venture capitalist who evaluates startup companies. And she was talking about the three components that she looks at in companies that are gonna succeed. It's of course, how smart is the, are the team you know, is the team running that? You know, secondly, are they emotional, do they have emotional um, intelligence? So she looks at the IQ, she looks at the EQ, the emotional quotient, quotient but and she also looks at the ability of that team to adapt mm -hmm. because we've seen through this crisis that we've all had to adapt to a new way of working and it's unlikely that change is gonna slow down. Uh, we're going to run into the next pandemic, probably. We'll probably run into the next thing that we can't predict quite yet. And mm -hmm. our ability to be able to make changes and be more nimble, I think, is something that uh, I know is a is a challenge for us and our team. And I'm really proud of our team and how they've worked to adapt to the new normal. But it's not easy. 
and it's something that you get better at the more you practice. So, uh, I I think that one of the keys for businesses, and I think that we've we've dealt with several um, clients that are, you know, in various ways looking at this as a problem that needs to be solved, and I think that there's a clear distinction that needs to be made between a problem and a dilemma, because we're this is actually one of those dilemmas, sort of like cybersecurity in, in, in another way. You just don't solve this problem. Um, you're going to have to come to an operating sensibility and a new way of doing things that allows you to almost make this into how you do what you do. Um, and so understanding that this is a dilemma that's, that's going to be with us uh, for as long as, as we're around, you know, uh, that, that's a big deal because that's different than just trying to check a box and saying problem solved. Uh, that's, that's not something that we're going to be able to do on this. Do you see any places that there are um, training or certifications for folks that are responsible for checking the temperature or being the safety officer role? Are there any, any places that you can go to to find folks that are competent to do that even temporarily? You know, I, I haven't gone that far with it. I'm sure there are because they keep reiterating that you have to be properly trained. I don't know. Um, that it's necessarily a certification that's needed, but it's just learning the process, I think. We could probably get that information and get it out to folks if they want it. Mm -hmm. I also, I, we've talked about this a little bit, I think um, it's not going to be unheard of um, that there's some kind of certification or at least um, assurance that businesses have met these standards that will be issued probably by the state or even maybe by the federal government at some point, I guess, depending on how long we're in this. Um, I think that goes back to just wanting to protect uh, yourself from any kind of liability issue that, you know, not unlike taking care of people if you didn't have uh, exit signs posted during a fire or something like that. I think it could get to that point, uh, but we're not there yet. So how do you see this kind of translating when we get to the fall and we look at school? You know, if you've got 400 kids coming in in 15 minutes to get the classes, you know, the last 15 minutes or 800 kids, how, how will this happen with, you know, being able to meet the criteria of checking folks for temperature and things like that? Well, I have read a lot about that. Um, because I'm on a nonprofit board that deals with after school. And we have some of the recommendations, while there are no decisions have firmly been made, is that um, instead of kids moving classes, maybe it's teachers. So you have mm. all your kids in one co cohort and they would stay in place. They would eat in the room. They would basically have to stay in the room. So it wouldn't be the best case uh, scenario for kids to, you know, some kids to learn and not having recess and that, that type of thing. And also not having every child present every day, maybe one week you're there three days, the next week you're only there two days, and then you do the telelearning still on those off days. So something like that, just to lessen that, uh, the number of people coming in. But I know that even, you know, there are major factories around the state that have thousands of employees and they're going to do the temperature scans. So uh, something to think about is if, especially if you're a business, not so much of a school, obviously, but if you're a business, if people have to stand in line for 30 minutes to get in, mm -hmm. the, top, the clock should start probably when they get in line. So either you're, you know, that's just another hit that business is going to have to take that things are going to have to slow down for a while until we get used to um, the new normal. Good. Are there any other questions? I've got one more. It's, I know it's been covered. I guess I'm kind of still confused. The customers that come in, of course, will do the social distancing and all of that. 
we don't need to check their temperature, correct? I mean, or you just taking it at face value. I mean, they have to wear a mask. We'll probably require them. Well, I know for sure the mask, but as far as asking the customers questions or anything like that, how would you handle that? Well, and that's a good point. Right now, the, the, the industry's specific guidelines for the healthcare um, is that they had to take temperatures of all of the people coming in. So, you know, we didn't have a choice when we went to the eye doctor. If we wanted to come in and get service, we had to agree to the temperature scan. Now, I'm not sure exactly what your business is. So it may be that the industry specific recommendations that come out may not include that. I know that for, um, you know, at Toyota, for example, they are planning to do temperature checks for all of the employees as they enter the plant each day. So that's what I was saying. If, if someone refuses, what's going to be your policy? And if you don't mind me asking, what is your, what is your sector? So I'm the clerk at the city of Bloomfield, and then we also have water company with us as well. So I wouldn't be so much seeing people as the water company will be when people come in to pay bills. And so I, again, I would advise everyone to look at what is for their specific sector. But I know at least right now, say at a grocery store, they're not screening us for temperature, but they are putting up barriers. And even like at my hardware store, they constructed a plexiglass uh, shield so that the really the only transaction happens. Um, you have to line up everything so they can scan the barcode without touching it. And then um, you also pay without touching. So at a where in that type of situation, there might be a way where if there's no interaction, mm -hmm. um, except because there's plexiglass or something, you might not have to do it, but I'd have to look and they're, they're actually coming out with the guidelines for, for government agencies uh, okay. soon. So we'll just have to look at that and see. Okay. Cause I know we're going to have to do something because the lady who takes the water payments is completely high risk and love her to death. She's stubborn. So I know if I ask her to move to a different office and let me step in and take the payments, I know the answer is going to be a definite no. So I just want to make sure that she's really protected. Yeah. But I mean, under the, under the 10 rules, you're required to make special accommodations. So yes. Yeah, definitely. Those will be put in place. Yeah. Um, I just wish she would consider just even for the next 30 days, let someone else take the payments and she can process them or, or do something. But no, definitely the, what is the 10 rules that, that will be enforced. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we're all learning, but we just wanted to get everyone to start thinking about all the things that have to happen. Well, I appreciate all the information. It's extremely helpful for me. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that you got something out of it. And if it's okay, Bert, do you mind if I share the uh, the checklist that Renee's put together for us? Sure. Right. I'll stop sharing so that yep. you can put that up. I'll go ahead. Uh, we had a quick question from Nancy. If um, anybody foresees any, let's see the chat disappearing. So while, while you're uh, working to find that again, here's just an overview of the social distancing checklist that Renee's put together. It talks about things to think about. She said very, very helpful things. Uh, Renee, do you want to talk to this at all? Sure. I mean, again, these, are, these aren't uh, mandates, but they're just mm -hmm. ideas on how you can uh, address when people are entering and exiting the workplace, for example, you know, stagger your schedule times, restrict uh, access points. And part of that is so that you have less temperature checkers needed. <laughs> you may have multiple temperature checkers at one point, but 
you might not, if you have 12 access points into your business currently, then maybe you limit that to just a six or whatever. Um, but also just thinking about, like if you look at uh, the customer client restrictions, which is the second one there, is you, know, you, you have to reduce capacity in a lot of situations. So if the fire marshal currently says you can have 50 people in a room, now it may be 25, or it may even be less than that to, to accommodate that social distancing. Um, and just thinking about removing chairs that aren't necessary. For example, again, yesterday when I was at the, the eye doctor with my daughter, they basically had uh, just a couple of chairs and they had taken the other 12 that were in there the last time we were there and turned them against the wall so that nobody could sit in them. They had them all stacked up. So just doing things like that right now. But, but if you could you scroll on down to the next page? Um, Keep going. Well, I was just going to look at maybe like the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the time clock areas or the stairs, like go, go to the stairs where you have to maintain that six foot distance. So you really need to be thinking about uh, putting markings on the handrail and the ground to, to visualize because a lot of people don't realize what six feet actually look like, you know, looks like, and then providing hand sanitizer at the top and bottom. I know one place looked at just saying, well, you can't use the handrail. And, but, you know, for someone like me, who's kind of clumsy, that's not an option. I can't, <laughs> I have to use the handrail. So uh, just putting hand sanitizer at the top and bottom and, you know, creating rules like you can't linger in or on the stairs or, you know, if it's feasible, again, having one staircase that's designated for up and one that's down, or at least saying that you can't go up and down at the same time, you have to wait. And elevators, a lot of places are going to, have said they're going to make it where it's just for medically necessary or if you're transporting uh, a large item. But when you do use it, you have to have six foot social distancing. So a lot of times that's going to mean only one person at a time in an elevator. So um, you know, it's just stuff like that. And then again, in, in break rooms, there was a, there's a suggestion was made that you would remove all coffee pots, toasters, microwaves. But if you can't do that, then you would have to have a very strict policy on if you touch it, you sanitize it. So that it's on the employee to make sure that they've you know, done that. And in locker rooms, that's another example. If you do have locker rooms, you know, that can be really tricky because we all know how close lockers are. And that's another issue you know, Bert, I would assume that when schools do go back, they're going to probably, you know, not have lockers <laughs> for the yeah. students. Uh, but, you know, you have to, you can mark, that would be part of like what we did with the audit would be showing you where we'd have no sit zones um, or, and that could go for meetings or locker rooms or cafeterias or anything where you literally are marking off with X's where people can't be. Good. There are a lot of things to think about and a lot of <laughs> policies and procedures that need to be changed as a result of that, which Definitely. kind of a heavy lift as well. So, Well, just like in bathrooms, there's the suggestion that you would put partitions between urinals and sinks um, so that, you know, you've got that, you've met that requirement. So again, just preparing a business to reopen is going to be... Um, costly and adventurous to say the least. <laughs> mm -hmm. But we've got a couple questions about where we can get this information. I'm going to share my screen again and roll that. down to where the, the link is uh, so that people can get to this uh, as we, as we look at it here. And uh, we're in the Q and a, I've already stopped it. So okay. if you look on the left hand down and down, uh, there's the thank you to Renee, because this has been a, a wonderful conversation. We don't have to stop right now. But in that thank you section, there's the download, return to work, things to consider uh, at, at celerity.com, free resources. And then you can also read a blog post um, that Renee wrote and is on our site under our articles on COVID-19. 
Uh, so there are some good resources out there and some other, some other blog posts, but especially Renee's that, that she, you can uh, look in to uh, what's going on um, and, and some other considerations. I don't think we can see your screen. Um, it may just be me. You uh, can't see the screen. Okay, let's try this then. How about now? Does that work? Yes. Yeah, so it's thank you to the guest right here where I was, and then you can see the, the celerity for free resources, and then the uh, blog post, getting back uh, Kentucky back to work the right way. Okay. So Cole or, or Bud, I think there's some other folks that have been in the uh, chat, too. Mm -hmm. I was going to pull Cole's that And Cole provided a, a link to the free resources. Good. Download. Mm -hmm. And it looks like Nancy's asked, uh, do you foresee additional safety requirements for restaurants and groceries in terms of food handling and other sanitation areas? Very, um, pretty specific. Definitely on the restaurants. <laughs> restaurants are gonna be a huge challenge. Um, and I know even, I'm not sure how they're going to go back and handle groceries and things like that that weren't closed. If they'll create new standards, they certainly might. But I know I've noticed just from going to my uh, grocery, they've already started installing doors on all the produce and cheese and things that you used to be able to just walk up and get, um, which is kind of a catch 22 because now you have to touch it and somebody else could come along and touch it. But I know that they they are frequently going around and sanitizing all of those handles. I mean, you'll see workers in there almost constantly doing that. But certainly with restaurants, uh, th that is definitely going to be probably outside of childcare and schools. That's probably going to be one of the more tricky ones of how you uh, you know how you reopen. So the short answer is yes. Good. I think Sue was asking whether or not we could provide the links somewhere on the Celerity site. I think we can also put them into the download uh, yep. as well. Uh, so but we can definitely. If you, if you go to the Celerity website at uh, celerity.com, there's a, a link on that in the insights menu. It's called free resources. And so you can download from there. And Cole is. Uh, I'll post a link to that here in the chat as well. Yeah. And we can send that out to folks. But we've also that. got the, I think the mask link that was up there and the return to work um, uh, application and a couple of other links that were in the presentation that we can work mm -hmm. to get out. Yep. So I don't see any other uh, questions. And we're getting close to our time. So I just want to say, Renee, thank you so much for putting this together. I know that thank you, for uh, you having me. do a lot of good work in the community. And if, uh, if any of our folks have interest in contacting you, we've got the, the contact information here. And um, folks should feel free to reach out to Renee or to us if they want to get any more uh, information about uh, help with policies, procedures, checking in. Um, connecting with other other resources and I'm really excited to talk about our next session uh, next week. Uh, Bert, do you want to announce that or shall I go ahead? Why don't, why don't you go ahead and do that, bud? Great. So we have a special guest star next week. We appreciate our guest star this week with Renee. Um, who has been an expert who's grown up in the distillery industry over time, Tim Niddle, who is the owner of Distilled Living and who is the uh, bourbon aficionado who is uh, at the Kentucky Castle and also has designed curriculum at Midway University for its program. We'll be talking to us about um, how changes are, how these changes are affecting uh, tourism, uh, general administration, as it uh, relates to the distillery industry. So, uh, Tim, uh, if you wanted to say anything, feel free. I don't want to put Thank you on the spot. Sir. Thank you for this session. This was great, amazing information here. I think as we're getting further into the new normal, we're getting to that point where we can start seeing the individual differences among the different industries. 
um, as evidenced by some of the questions that we had here. So uh, yeah, next week we're gonna be looking kind of uh, the new normal as the broad category, we're looking at tourism. We're a ways away from being able to reopen and we may be reopening in a staggered, phased and reversed kind of approach. Um, and, and then kind of narrow down for some best practices around uh, the distillery and bourbon tourism and Kentucky tourism industries, um, especially from an administrative standpoint. Even if we don't know rules and regulations, um, these best practices, how we apply those that we've been learning through these, these sessions uh, into that industry. So I'm really looking forward to that. And thank you for having me for that. Thanks, Tim. And it looks like we do have one other question. One is that, uh, would there be interest in a training class that relates to getting back to the new normal? So um, that's something that uh, we have talked about doing. Um, I guess that would just be a general question that we could ask the, the audience as a whole. Would there be any interest in a more detailed class or guidance in getting back to the new normal? So I don't see any there. But general question, if there is interest, feel free to reach out and let us know. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Bert. Well, thank you all again for attending. This is this is turned into a, a conversation that I look forward to every week. I look forward to meeting our guests and working with, uh, looking looking at their stuff and talking with them, you know, their content and talking with them and learning so much about this. So again, thank you, Renee. I've learned so much. Uh, it's it's a privilege to get to know you and uh, continue to work. You know, I expect we'll continue to work together and, and have great conversations around this. We do have the session uh, with Tim coming up next week uh, in kind of the distillers vertical. Uh, and that will be May 14th at 12 p.m. And there, that will be on a Zoom meeting and on Facebook Live. So. I'll uh, give you a couple minutes back today. Use them well. I hope everybody's uh, safe and well at home. And if you need anything from us, please feel free uh, to reach out. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you all. Bye. Bye.